Uh, we're here at the Lenara Connect uh, 2018 here in Hong Kong, and uh, who are you? Thomas Evanson, so I'm the CTO for Embedded Software at Silinx. And uh, you just had a keynote, so uh, what are you talking about? It's really about how you can use an FPGA from a software point of view. Typically what people have been doing is programming these FPGAs, it's programmable hardware basically. So doing that with hardware description languages like VHDL and Verilog, What's new now is that you can actually write your C code, C++ and OpenCL and get that automatically then compiled into the FPGA and get massive parallelism and really high performance. Is that a tool that converts uh, that C code and all that stuff? It converts it into FPGA code? E exactly. So basically what you do is so you write the program and then you point to a function or a few functions you want to have running in the FPGA and just either with command line options or from, from the GUI, you tell the compiler so that the rest of the code will go through your regular GCC or what have you. The rest of the stuff that's going to the FPGA will go through our high level synthesis tools and be placed into the FPGA. Because the FPGA is a, is a pretty awesome thing, right? It like, has lots of performance, but it's, it's like programmable. So it's like magic. What is this kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. So an FPGA is really different things for different people. From uh, a software point of view, think of it as programmable hardware. So you can, you know, what people are doing otherwise is they're creating their own ASICs for some very specific optimizations, like transcoding video or doing machine learning, neural networks, and so on. Here you can program that. So the hardware is actually programmable, so you can change what the hardware is doing. And that's really exciting. And, and then you can choose if you want to use your traditional hardware description languages to do this, or now using C code and you know the stuff that people like me understand. But if you use C code or other kind of software, does that is that not the optimal way of doing FPJ code? It, it's optimal very often from a time point of view, how long it takes. Hardware is very, very parallel, so the trick is always how do you express that parallelism in your C code, which is a very sequen sequential language where you do A and then B and then C. So typically what you do is that you put the stuff you want to calculate in a loop, and then you say that, all right, I want to explode this loop and run maybe 100 of these iterations every clock cycle. Right? That's how you get the, the, the big gain in performance. So I'm guessing the, the super expert engineer software developers in the FPGA uh, field are maybe uh, cutting edge in terms of uh, in general uh, chip chip programming uh, because what it, it sounds like the FPGA you can program it to do many different things at different times you can like it's not just doing one thing no, you can do uh, all no, kinds of things exactly so our customers are actually changing it depending on the use case they just change sort of the, the hardware if you will the programmable hardware uh, you, you can imagine if you have a device, for example, and then you have, during the day you need to do something and something else during the night, or even if you push this button, then you want to show something on, on, on the screen that's very different and you want to accelerate different things. So it's programmable from that point of view. And, and what's new now is, is that the software guys can do that programming uh, as opposed to just the, you know, the hardware guys that's been traditionally doing it. And uh, I guess maybe some of your customers are like completely changing the strategy and keeping the same hardware, just loading a new thing, and then it's like different. Exactly. It's really good for platforms. You can imagine a company that wants to build a standardized platform for lots of different devices. So they can do that. And then depending if you want to put that stuff into a robot, for example, then you have some things that you're putting into to the fabric. Or if you want to have the same platform doing something with, with uh, something completely different. You have the same platform from a software point of view. It looks the same and, and so on. It, it really simplifies things. And if you want to emulate like the kind of stuff that an ARM processor does, you can do that too? Well, we have embedded the ARM cores there, so you run that stuff on the ARM cores. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to emulate a bigger one, let's say. Yeah, so that's another use case of FPGAs that people have been doing is for emulation. So then you have take our really big FPGAs and you put multiple of those onto a board and, and people like the emulation companies, they are using FPGAs for that so that when you emulate your ASICs, you use FPGAs so that you can run in, you know, at a fairly high speed. Uh, while you are testing out or your chip before you go to tape out, because that's super expensive, of course. Testing out if the design is a good idea or something like that. Both a good idea, but also that it's correct. You know, you can ch look for correctness and, and uh, find bugs in it, and so on, and timing issues. So uh, here at the Lenara Connect is really cool. We're launching the 96 boards. That means uh, you want to open it up to many more people to. 
to start working with FPGA? Exactly. So the, the new thing here is a board we call the Ultra 96. So it's a 96 board compatible, which is really important because that means that for software people, they know exactly what's, what's there. But then on top of that, you can add your own accelerators and we have lots of examples on how you can do that. So you have neural network uh, stuff, you have face recognition, you know, those kind of things as an example. Uh, so you get the best of both worlds, the, the standardized software development environment, but then the, this kind of specialized acceleration. It's, right? it's 249, for, exactly, and it's really aimed for software guys. Uh, typically what we've done before with boards is that we have lots of different connectors so people can try out those kind of things, the right? Other, the other boards you have are like big ones? They are expensive? typically big and expensive, How yeah. Usually for oh, they can easily be a few thousand dollars for, for, for the boards, yeah. yeah, for the bigger so boards. this is just 249? 249. And the Ultrasight Plus, which is like the latest uh, mass market uh, the most popular right now? Yeah. The most popular it, 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 yeah, no, it, it is of, of, the, of the new generation. Of course, we sell a boatload of the older generations, of course, right? They're they not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but of the new 16 nanometers, it's that, that's like a popular. The, the current flagship, kind of, right? Uh, yeah, no, it's. it's well, mass market, kind of. Flagship. Yes. And we, and we have different sizes of the FPGA as, as well, right? So, uh, but on, on this one is uh, a part that's really popular in automotive, for example, for driver assist. So this exact part is, is uh, used a lot in the industry right now. So. And uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday or a couple of days ago, uh, Sinex announced uh, next gen, Yes, right? yes, the seven nanometer. Seven nanometer. Yeah. System. It's getting small, <laughs> for That's sure. Tiny. It is, yes. So, so this is a really exciting uh, announcement. So the current generation is on 16 nanometers, so as you can imagine. Which is pretty good already. Yeah, 16. yeah. No, absolutely. So That's in advanced. This, uh, Ultra 96 is 16 nanometer. 16 nanometer, exactly. Which is pretty good. Yeah. And so, but next generation is in seven nanometer. Uh, and so we just announced it. We sort of announced the high-level details of it, but we expect really high performance out of it, maybe 20 times for neural networks if you compare it with the current vertex that people are using in, in uh, like Amazon Cloud and, and things like that. We have the, the FPGAs in the cloud, so we, we really think we'll get a massive uh, improve, improvement in performance. So companies like Amazon, they're like optimizing their AIs with the FPGAs on the cloud. So, so this is not only for cars and stuff like that? Is for the data center too? Oh, absolutely, and, and, and that's where Everest is really focusing on, uh, is the, the data center. And in the data center, you have lots and lots of different use cases. It's a, if it had been one killer application, someone would have done an accelerator just for that, right? But there are so many different tasks that's running in the data center, and that's the nice thing with FPGA, because then you can, you know, doing a, a video transcoding, for, for one customer, and then the next second you're running something completely different, like a neural network, uh, some AI's face recognition or something like that, and then the next you do something else. So. And maybe it's a nice, potentially it's a nice platform for people to who, who provide a, a cloud as a service. E exactly. To thousands of different customers, everybody has their own their own designs. Exactly. So for the Amazon right? exa example, it's Amazon F1, so it's FPGA as a service. So you, you pay for the time you actually run it on, on, on the servers. So that's potentially a huge part of this next gen, right? Yeah. Data no, that, center. It's de definitely an important part of our strategy going forward is data centers and, and uh, Everest really uh, hitting the sweet spots there. So you call it uh, ACAP and uh, Everest, right? Yeah, so Everest is the, so I'm, I'm the techie guy here, so we've been using Everest is our code name, internal code name. ACAP is, is more the official name. Everest is the highest mountain in the world, right? There you go, yeah. So that may be one of the reasons or something you want to be the, some kind of highest. Yeah, we, actually our code names has been mountains for, for some reason that I don't even recall. Uh, so we've always been using mountains for, uh, for our code names. So, but what's so, higher after Everest? I know. We, we probably have to look at, at planets, mountains right? on other planets, I know. Yeah, so, Mars or something. Exactly. Just giving ideas. Yeah, yeah. But so, uh, so how about this trend that's going on where the ARM SOCs, they want to do their NPU neural processing units and stuff like that. How does yes. that compare with doing running it on FPGA? Yeah, no, it, I mean, obviously machine learning is getting big all over the place, right? Sure. And, and uh, if you know exactly the network you're going to optimize and so on, yeah, you can do very specific things. What we believe is that 
the FPD has a lot of, of value to add because we can do the neural networks really fast, but you can also do other things like connections uh, into it. We can do other workloads as well. So that flexibility gives us, we think, a leg up really that we can both do machine learning very, very efficient, but we can do other things as well. So it's really utilizing the same hardware for multiple things because in the data center, you can imagine, they don't want to have one card for that, that acceleration and another card for another acceleration, they want to have standardized on what kind of cards they put in there. So uh, the FPG is not just like glue logic or something like that? No, that's the old way of thinking? That's the, yeah, a lot of people... It's just like and, and prototyping it's, future stuff. Yeah, so, so a lot of people still, of course, if you're connecting uh, your, your FPG to real world stuff like uh, field buses or, or uh, industrial ethernet and so on, and you want to have some glue still being used for that, of course, right? But the exciting part that we're talking about here is more the use it as an accelerator. I did some videos at Mobile Walk Congress. It seems that there is a new, also a new growing market for signings to do uh, networking, uh, software defined networking, maybe, or some kind of acceleration in the 5G network and all that stuff. Right? Yes, yes. So, so we've been in, so wireless has been been a big market for us for a long time. You, you can imagine you get an antenna signal coming in and then you need to do a lot of processing on a parallel processing to figure out exactly what, what uh, bits are, are in there. And so FPGAs are, are used for that, for that calculation because you can do massively parallel calculations with it. Uh, and, uh, and a new thing, a, a product that we also introduced here uh, fairly recently, uh, last year, something we call RFSOC, where we have integrated the AD converters and the DA converters, which means that in, in one chip, uh, you can get the analog signal straight into the chip uh, and then you d digitize it and, and convert it to packets or what, what have you. So it's one SOC that does RF also. Exactly, exactly, and which that's is really cool. very useful for the mobile, uh, the telecom uh, uh, industry, right? Uh, absolutely, because in, in the past you used to have separate chips for that and then you had a really high serial connection, a service, into like an FPGA and that consumes a lot of power. So if you take away that and immediately go in with, with the analog signal, uh, then the saving is, is quite a bit on the power side. And there was also a big boost of signings in the embedded world. Mm -hmm. So that's also an important part of signings is the embedded market, right? Which a one is? A a absolutely. Yeah. Well, to today, so depending how you define the embedded market, of course, most of the things we're doing today is embedded. Right? So even the wireless, when we're in, in a base station, that would be an embedded market. We're not in mobile markets, but our big markets are wireless and wired. You have uh, industrial, you have automotive is really big for us. Things like uh, driver assist, uh, those kind of things, using our parts quite a bit. We're in uh, aerospace, defense, and so on. So it's a fairly horizontal technology that you can use for a lot of different things and that's one of the values for us we can with one chip we can hit all these different markets are you in the consumer or professional cameras because I never know what they're using these guys when they do like you know uh, it seems that they update the software on the camera suddenly it does more codex it does all these and it sounds like it sounds like kind of like an FPGA yeah so so in broadcast that, that's another use case for example and and uh, actually we were in a lot of 4K TVs uh, early on when they came out. Uh, so th the interesting thing is that you have FPGAs in a lot of different things. And sometimes I don't know it myself. And someone says, hey, do you know that there's an FPGA in, <laughs> in XYZ device? And uh, they're all over the place. Uh, very often a little bit hidden because it's not the thing you talk about, right? So, so Silex is the leader, right? Absolutely, yes. And there's yes. like thousands of engineers doing this? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just Everest alone has been, I think, about 1,500 engineers involved in that. So, so, so it's a big like, program. How do you organize all these people? Are you helping, <laughs> are you part of the organization of all these uh, well, so I'm on, engineers? So software I'm on the software people? side, and obviously a lot of the engineers are working more on the hardware side, right? Yeah. Uh, what I'm involved in is to make sure that we have the right operating systems. As you can imagine, these kind of chips is very heterogeneous. So different types of CPUs and you have this code that's getting accelerated. How do you connect all that stuff from a software point of view, making it easier for software developers? That, that's my area of the, that I'm working on. There's also Cortex-R on the SOC, on the, on the Ultra Sock Plus, uh, the Ultra 96, right? Yes. And so yes. that means you do, you can, you, it can be compatible with a safety application or something that's important to be like uh, real-time or something? E exactly. So on, that, uh, on the Ultra 96 board, we have uh, four A53s. 
typically people are running Linux on those, uh, maybe hypervisor like Xen or something like that, and maybe Linux and some other things. On the R5 cores, which we call the RPUs, the real-time process unit, they're real-time, obviously a big thing, because you don't get as many cache layers in between and so on, so it's much more predictable, deterministic there. When, very important when you connect into the, uh, to the uh, fabric, the programmable logic. Uh, but it's also used for safety, uh, so safety certification, so we have the hardware itself, it's been uh, safety certified, and so that's a good place to put your uh, safety certified code. And uh, um, so it's, it's quite uh, exciting for you to see Linaro and uh, the open source community optimize all the Linux stuff that's going to happen with your, with your, and is there a special way you have to build a Linux for plugging into the FPGA? Well, so, so that's an interesting question. question. To, to some extent with the Ultra 96 board, yeah. you have standardized a lot of the different things. Of course, if someone in the programmable logic wants to put in another network driver, right, for example, then one way of doing that is to reconfigure the kernel, rebuild the kernel. What we really are trying to get people to do is to more use uh, device tree overlays, as it's called, so that you dynamically load that, that driver and tell Linux that it's so you don't have to change the Linux image every time you do something. But if the interesting thing when you have uh, programmable hardware basically is that anyone can change so it looks like a completely new SOC from a software point of view. So that's why you have to be so careful about putting stuff in user space when you access it or, or using a, a loadable kernel module as opposed to every time recompile the kernel when you so put it in the So they have standards program. or something like that? Yeah, so the community has standards for, for doing those things. And what we are pushing standards is how do you yeah. interface between different types of cores, different operating systems. Uh, that's an effort called OpenAMP that we are leading uh, because that, that's really where, where the future is, that you, you don't have just homogeneous cores that are doing the same thing. You have the specialized cores. And then, so far, people are doing ad hoc communication between the cores, ad hoc lifecycle management. So we are together with a bunch of other companies like TI and ST and NXP and, and uh, Qualcomm and, and so on, and ARM, of course, uh, and Linaro, standardizing how to do those kind of the things. heterogeneous multi Multiple, exactly, multiple operating system, how do you start up something on another core, and, and, and so on. So we're doing that, both standardizing it, but uh, even more important, an open source project that's in the Linaro Lite organization. So one of the things I like with the ARM stuff is uh, the new thing they're doing with the emulating x86 apps uh -huh. uh, on those uh, new Windows laptops. Is it something that could be also done on the FPGA, is it emulate x86? Uh, I mean, theoretically, you can do that. You can do pretty much anything on it. I haven't seen anyone do that particular okay. one. What we do do is that we have our own what we call soft cores, so, so small CPUs that we put into the fabric. So you can, you know, have hundreds of those if you have a big FPGA, uh, and then you can program all that. So you can create your own massively parallel uh, networks of, of CPUs in the fabric itself, and then you can have the ARM core sort of get the load out to them, and so on. So there are lots of uh, really you know, innovative things going on in, in the fabric. And I think I saw on the new announcement the 7 nanometer is going to have 50 billion transistors or some crazy huge amount. That's crazy that's huge. Like the, that's yes. why Everest is like the biggest. <laughs> exactly. There's no chip with that many billions of transistors. <clears throat> yeah. I hope they all work. They have to all work, right? <laughs> they have to, and, and that's something that's really, really important for us, of course, is, is the whole quality, quality control. We have a really good reputation on, on that, because as you can imagine, doing a new tape out costs a lot of money, so you really want to get it right. When there's 50 billion transistors. Yeah, exactly. Out. So what you really have to do is emulate that before you, you get to, to that point, right? So all, all the CPUs and all that stuff, you want to emulate that. And hey, guess what? FPGAs are really good at emulating it, so we really eat our own dog food in that respect. And you say there's a lot of hardware designers at Silinx. Oh yeah. But yeah. they cannot just do whatever they want. They have to. <laughs> they have to work for you, basically. They have to customize the hardware to what the software people want. Uh, so part of that is, but a lot of that is standard. On the software side, a lot of it's standard. We're using standard ARM cores and, and so on. On the FPGA side. Uh, so that's something we're working on, is creating more standards. How do you actually get your... Uh, so uh, what they're mostly focusing on is making sure that they can accelerate things like neural networks really, really fast. And this is a new area that a lot of uh, 
a lot of research is going into, and, and that's why we are doing things a little bit different in the next generation, so that we can shuffle the data a little bit differently and, and have really massively uh, DSP capabilities in it. And that FPGA, that fabric, that's your that's your thing, right? So that's our thing. That's yeah. That's your thing, and exactly. you're the leader in that. And but I guess you have a proprietary way of doing that. But um, is there any way to 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 explain how you differ from another FPGA company or how, how's your secret ingredient? Well, the, the language that hardware developers are using is VHDL and Verilog, those kind of yeah. languages. So you can have design for one FPGA and then move to another. You have to do a little bit of work, but, but that's sort of standardized at that level. What we're trying to do now and, and other FPGA companies as well is to use higher level languages like OpenCL and then the standard becomes the language definition as opposed to how the hardware implements it. Is it like an app store? So don't really have an app store for FPGA, that's a great idea, so you know, stay tuned that that might come someday uh, because I, I, I think that as we go forward, if you're a software developer, would it be nice to just go to an app store and say, oh, that accelerator, I want that one and that one and that one. And I need a self-driving thing. Yeah, exactly. And just take from somebody who would like to provide it to you, maybe. It, it, exactly. So, so far, uh, you know, th that doesn't exist. Uh, so now you work, if you get stuff from our partners, you know, you go in and, and get it from them directly. Awesome. So really looking forward to 50 billion transistor and see what, it, what it's going to do. What is it going to yeah. change the world? Um, when people have this stuff, like, what, is, what's gonna, it's just gonna, is it too much? Is it like, the techno, <laughs> is it Skynet? Uh, no. Yeah, I, personally, I think we're far away from, from the machines taking over. I hope okay. I, I'm gone by when, when we get that. But the AI that we're seeing now, the enormous explosion, I think that will help quite a bit with a lot of things that we're doing today. I mean, ob the obvious example is autonomous cars, right? And, and we play a big part on that. Uh, we have uh, many customers using our chips for really to get to get to the autonomous car mission. So it has the it, best uh, uh, power efficiency. Because yeah. You don't so want to use too much power, but you want to do lots of AI. Exactly. Very, very often, it's like, for example, if you have a forward facing camera in a car, it can't really use more like than five watts. So you're not going to put in a big honky GPU thing there, right? And then melt the window. <laughs> so, so that's not going to work. So that's why you have the spectrum, of, of, but it's always power uh, efficiency is really, really important. Even in the data center, right? Because electricity is one of the big, uh, big costs there. And it's interesting to see the whole uh, industry doing all kinds of different things. Some people are trying to do stuff on GPUs, the other are trying to make yeah. new machine learning chips, and uh, exactly. the ARM is getting faster and all that, but it's going to be yeah. interesting to see how it plays out. It will be interesting, and I, I personally don't think there's a one-size-fits-all here, and that's why it's good to be an FPGA company, because you can have lots of different sizes, if you will, in the FPGA, so you can test out a lot of different things. But there will be definitely some workloads where a GPU is better than, than an FPGA, and yeah, then, then you should use the GPU for it. But uh, the, and the flexibility. DSP guys also. And the DSP guys as well, right? Um, yeah. So, but uh, uh, we have that, it's so expensive to come up with a new ASIC, so unless you have really, really high volumes, then something that's more programmable, uh, like an FPGA, becomes uh, a better choice. And who knows, maybe the bulk of the market of the future is going to be lots of small projects that don't have the possi possibility to, to, to make a, a huge quantities of something. So I, I think that's definitely a trend. If you the look Internet at of Things is a lot of small projects. Exactly, and if you look at the industrial Internet of Things, right, there are lots, but it's not the one thing that goes to millions and millions of people. You have different things in different factories, absolutely.